Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone in this room. Thank you to organizers and also the rest of the room for your attention. I know we're coming down towards the end of the day, and um, yeah, lunch and carbs are starting to kick in for sure. So I feel like we've talked about everything, so I'm going to try to keep it um, a little bit light and talk about humor. Um, and um, yeah, even though it's about humor, it's a very like literature presentation. So I will be reading and there will be close reading. So um, don't, this is not that kind of performance, although I wish I could do that. Um, okay. Um, humor has served writers of slave narratives in the 19th century to challenge and speak back to power. Since the mid-20th century, scholars like Daryl Dance have argued that humor, in particular satire, was employed by authors of slave narratives as an instrument to keep despair at bay, to hide aspects of a harsh lived reality, to point out the irony of institutions, to signal the unethical behavior of whites, and to outsmart or get revenge on their oppressors by presenting them as foolish. In Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom, Ellen and William Kraft appealed to humor in all the previously mentioned ways. Published in 1860, Running recounts Ellen and William Kraft's there and escape from Macon, Georgia to Philadelphia in 1848, when Ellen passed as a disabled white man, William Johnson, and William Kraft as his slave. Authored by both and narrated by William Kraft, their narrative can be structurally broken down into three parts the social and cultural context of their escape, their escape from the South, and their final escape from the North to England. And that was after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. While humor is used throughout to denounce slavery and those who enforced it, I'm interested in exploring the potentiality and limits of satire, in particular the punchline to Fisher and reenact structures of power. So before describing their escape in the narrative, we learn about their preparations, where humor is already employed to challenge um, slavery and those who enforce it. To absent themselves long enough to board a steamer, William and Ellen set out to procure a special pass given to some enslaved people on Christmas. When writing about this event, William Kraft comments, some of the best slaveholders will sometimes give their favorite slaves a few days holiday at Christmas time. So after no little amount of perseverance of my wife's part, she obtained a pass from her mistress, allowing her to be away for a few days. The cabinet maker with whom I work gave me a similar paper, but said he needed my services very much and wished me to return as soon as the time granted was up. I thanked him kindly, but somehow I have not been able to make it convenient to return yet, and as the free air of good old England agrees so well with my wife and our dear little ones, as well as myself, it's not likely we shall return at present to the peculiar institution of chains and stripes. Satire in this passage positions the cabinet maker as the punchline, the fool under whose ignorance the joke operates. However, satire and sarcasm function in multiple registers through the punchline. Structurally, the punchline is composed of three parts the introductory frame, framing of a joke, the narrative setup, and the punchline itself. Semantically, the punchline signals a turn of perception. To be funny, it must present two incompatible situations where one is implicit and the one that is stated is a slanted or altogether version, altogether different version. This alteration of the original scenario makes the audience reconsider what is implicit and see it under a different light. It also makes both situations possible, even if one of them borders an irony. For instance, and this is the same quote, William Kraft's indifferent tone, marked by his lengthy wordiness at the, and the temporal construction of not at all likely that we shall return, stands in contrast to the cabinet maker's implicit frustration in learning of their escape. These two conflicting situations find comedic relief through the punchline. In this case, the cabinet maker's bothered affect is in direct relation to the political economy of slavery and his position in it. 
The comedic relief here partially arises from the contrast between the cabinet's maker entanglement with the institution of slavery, next to the narrative voice of William Craft speaking on lecture circuits in London, unbothered by the promise he was once forced to make. Reading these lines, we think and laugh alongside an unbothered William Craft about the bothered cabinet maker tinkering with his wood. Didn't land. <laughs> I try to insert a punchline, but it's an academic situation, it's all right. But it pass. In this act of communal laughter, the punchline performs something similar to what Caitlin Wood calls cracking up a modality of black feminist comedy in the 20th and 21st century that cracks up historical legacies of racialized and gendered violence in the US. To Wood, cracking up both breaks down and opens up. It's a creation of a fissure that if once released perhaps can no longer be fully sutured. It is a method of speaking truth to power and to fellow black women outside the purview of dominant culture. While well, what's cracking up is a stronger and more sonically vibrant laughter that borders on a loss of control, her configuration offers a way to think about the punchline as a sonic modality that fishes structures of power, opening up new configurations and relationalities. In other words, it's a way of speaking to power, but also speaking to marginalized communities. The framing of this punchline presents another contrast between the freer of um, good old England at the end of the passage and that of the U.S., or as William Craft calls it, the peculiar institution of chains and stripes. Here, chains and stripes have a metaphorical relationship with slavery, corporeal punishment, and torture, and they're also literal facts that contradict the euphemistic metaphor of the peculiar institution. Compared to other models of slave narratives that employ sentimentalism to enact moral suasion, the narrator sustains a different and distant tone. Sentimentalism was a rhetorical device employed by abolitionists um, in the 19th century to denounce the institution of slavery and shed light on the humanity of enslaved people. Among these, white American sentimentalist um, authors and narratives in particular employ this rhetoric to endow slaves with humanity while simultaneously evacuating them of citizenship. While sentimentalism was effective in mobilizing a national abolitionist sentiment, it asked that formerly enslaved writers perform a kind of transparency or prescribed authenticity that often continued to reinscribe them as different and less than whites. If this passage were to follow sentimentalist conventions in place of a punchline, the ending would expose a violent situation, illustrating the inhumanity of slavery through the narrator's embodied experience. Instead, William Craft refuses the sentimentalist turn and denounces slavery and its oppressors. In doing so, he reclaims agency and opacity by metonymically juxtaposing the emblem of US citizenship with chains and stripes. The concluding punchline traverses the particularity of the oppressor, like the cabinet maker, as well as the institution of slavery. In other words, it asserts William and Ellen Craft's opacity while transversely re-signifying ide ideas of nation and freedom. While the previous example of satire allows the narrator to denounce slavery and resist models of sentimentalism and transparency, in the next example, we will explore how satire and the punchline operate under hierarchies of race and gender in their narrative. During their journey, Ellen Craft as William Johnson and William Craft boarded a train from Wilmington, North Carolina to Richmond, Virginia, where they would board a steamboat to Washington, D.C. When a white man and his two daughters sit next to William Johnson, a peculiar and comedic situation unfolds. The two daughters develop a liking for Ellen Craft as William Johnson. They share a friendly and flirtatious chat, and they even make pillows from their shawls to comfort him. While Ellen Craft as William Johnson sleeps, William Craft details a conversation that ensued between the girls and their father. After, and I quote, after he had been laying a little while with the ladies, I suppose, thought he was asleep. Uh, so one of them gave a long sigh and said in a quiet, fascinating tone, Papa, he seems to be a very nice young gentleman. But before Papa could speak, the other lady said quickly, oh dear me, I never felt so much for a gentleman in my life. To use an American expression, they fell in love with the wrong chap. 
The concluding punchline cuts through the awkwardness of the moment's shifting desire, where the two women lust after Ellen Kraft, passing as William Johnson, while Ellen's husband, William Kraft, watches. In comparison to the previous passage, the humor here is less an is anxious, less indifferent. This punchline cracks up to use Wood's concept, but in a different way. It puts pressure on and blurs the lines of heterosexual and homosocial desire, which in this scene moves between women and men. While the punchline um, labels dissident desire um, as incorrect, the scene brings dissident sexualities into focus, including William Kraft's own, which he tries to recuperate through the scene, as we will cover in the next moments. Um, but first, we'll start with, I thought I was in this one, with this passage. Um, the wrong chap um, at the end of the passage is a direct reference to William Johnson's black and female identity. This wrong chap denotes that there is a right chap who should be desired in his place. If we follow the structure of US 19th century patriarchy, that chap would be a white man. However, the only other chap present in this scene is William Kraft. By positioning himself as the right chap, William Kraft, and here when I say William Kraft, I'm not talking about the person as much as the narrator um, of the, the narrative, pushes against 19th century representations of black masculinity as threatening. At the same time, he distances himself away from any admission of desire for his wife acting as William Johnson. The punchline becomes a space where William Kraft can find comedic relief in a situation where he, like the two women, is also positioned as a fool, lusting for Ellen as the wrong chap. William Kraft uses humor to diffuse the threat of homosexual panic, and in doing so, positions himself in control of both the setting, the fact that Ellen, um, that William is Ellen Kraft, the punchline, and ultimately the narrative voice. Each set weight theory of homosocial bonds can help us think through the dynamics of race, gender, power, and desire here. In between men, English literature, and the male homosocial, homosocial desire, said weight argues that love triangles in literature are used to express homosocial desire and to circulate power between men and share in its continuity. Sedwick's theory in this passage of running is traversed by race. Instead of a triangle, we see a pentagon of desire, where the two daughters represent the white woman character, William Johnson is the androgynous and racially ambiguous male character, Papa the white male character in power, and William Kraft, our narrator, the enslaved black man. Through the punchline, the two daughters are structured as love fools, and their desire finds expression, but without climax. Instead, fulfilled desire and power are secure between men. At one point in the scene, while William Johnson sleeps, Papa asks um, William Kraft to take care of him and gives him a ten piece, ten pence, to which William Kraft writes, He thanked me and gave me a ten cent piece and requested me to be attentive to my good master. I promised that I would do so and have ever since endeavored to keep my pledge. Masculinity and power here are signaled by the transfer of capital, promise, and desire between men. The punchline makes this transfer and continuity possible, even if the promise will be broken in the future. The interaction between these characters concludes in Papa asking Ellen Kraft as William Johnson to visit him and his family the next time he's in the area. According to William Kraft, Papa said, I shall be pleased to see you and so will my daughters. Mr. Johnson expressed his gratitude for the proffered hospitality and said he should feel glad to call on his return. I have not the slightest doubt that he will fulfill the promise whenever that return takes place. The dialogue between Papa and um, William Johnson is mediated by William Kraft's narrative voice, evaluating, evacuating William Johnson of direct speech. William Kraft rearranges the transference of power from Papa to himself using his wife and the women's desire for William Johnson to secure his bond with Papa. Without the punchline, this scenario would read much like an episode of racist paternalism. The punchline allows William Kraft to transfer power to himself as a narrator through William Johnson's performance of race and gender. 
Even while it reinforces homosocial desire, the punchline nonetheless renders the two scenarios possible through its structure, homosocial bonds and the transference of masculine power, and sexually dissident feelings <coughs> between William Johnson and William Craft uh, and William Johnson and the two women. William Craft offers a very controlled punchline that sutures sexuality and reaffirms this transference of power, but like Wood mentions, never to be the same. Dissident desire cracks up, cracks up the narrative, even if for an instance. While Ellen and William Craft were living in England, Ellen Craft staged an engagement <coughs> as William Johnson. In passing performances, Ellen Craft's fugitive selves, Yara Macmillan argues that Ellen's restaging of William Johnson for the engraving and the use of this image in the book breaks the temporal logic of the image. Um, in this version, it's in the back, but there are some versions, a lot of them, where the engraving is in the, is in the front. Following Re Rebecca Schneider's theory, Macmillan also contends that the reproduction of the image on the book reenacts Ellen Craft's performance as William Johnson for the, audi for the audience. If we draw from Macmillan and Schneider's formulation and apply it to the punchline, the sonic reverberations of the punchline and its laughter perform a textual and sonic reenactment of the joke, cracking up and resisting dominant structures of humanity. There's not really a prepackaged way to categorize humor in this narrative. It's not packaged sentimentalism. It's also not a radical subversion of power. The punchline helps to make contradicting realities legible without giving into a prescribed sentimentalism or transparency. The punchlines reject evolution and work that seeks to enact moral suasion also. So much of what is, uh, of what was and is evolution is work without an inside, and it's work against assimilation, knowing that that is in a way unavoidable. The punchline is a moment of relief, of relief. It introduces laughter and play. It is also a liminal space that holds contradiction. In doing so, it can help us map the contours, limits, and tensions um, of abolition, including its conservative forms, providing an opening into making and rehearsing effective abolitionist geographies.